Hello everyone and welcome to ML Dawn. In the previous video we talked about the perceptron training rule and we ended our discussion with the fact that as amazing as the perceptron training rule was, there was one major drawback to this amazing training rule. And it was the fact that when the training data is not linearly separable, the perceptron training rule failed to converge to any solution. So just to recap, when it comes to training a neural network, we have two main solutions. Uh, one is the perceptron training rule discussed earlier, and the other one, which is uh, my favorite, this one is amazing actually, uh, it's called the delta rule. Um, um, and th the delta rule is actually quite amazing because uh, that sort of, uh, t it is tightly related to this amazing algorithm called uh, the backpropagation algorithm, the backprop, let's call this the backpropagation algorithm in artificial neural networks, which is the very foundation of training, uh, the, the very foundation of uh, techniques for training a neural network, regardless of how complicated your neural network is, regardless of um, what type of neural network you're dealing with, whether it is um, kernel-based neural networks like the um, RBF, radial basis function neural networks, whether um, you've got let's say a um, maybe recurrent neural networks like R and Ns. Um, some of you might have heard actually the, the famous uh, backpropagation technique in a recurrent neural networks that is called uh, the backpropagation BP uh, through time, which sort of <laughs> sounds like uh, one of those science fiction uh, terminologies, but but that is actually true. We do the backpropagation algorithm uh, across the time domain, or other types of neural networks like uh, filter-based ones, like neighborhood or local ones, like the convolutional neural networks or CNNs. So regardless of what type of neural network you're dealing with, this delta rule uh, is going to stand ruling and it's going to uh, prove to impress us actually. So today we're going to talk about the delta rule in more detail. We're just going to devote the, uh, this video to the first part of the delta rule and then we're going to continue with that in the upcoming videos. So the main reason that people even bothered with the delta rule was that uh, the earlier version um, of training methods for training uh, neural networks, uh, aka the perceptron training rule, um, actually failed to converge under certain circumstances. Like for example, if you think about uh, a training set, let's say we have positive and negative examples, um, let's say we have only two features, let's say this is my uh, axes, these are my axes, and let's say we have two features like x1 and x2 as my features, and let's say we have only two classes, and the job that we were trying to do is actually a binary binary classification task, right? So we've got, uh, for example, positive, and let me use another color here, um, the positive and the negative examples, right? So let's say that our negative examples are distributed in our feature space, like, um, let's say like this. Right, and let's say our positive examples are distributed like um, this, like this. Now, um, if I ask you that, uh, is there a linear separation possible? Is uh, can we just use a linear model to uh, define the boundary between these two uh, classes of training uh, examples? Uh, the answer is no. It's not simply not possible. There's no line that you could draw that would, uh, f you know, separate the two classes uh, perfectly. So in these cases, actually, the the famous uh, perceptron training rule uh, mi would miserably fail, fail, actually. So that is why the delta rule came to rescue us. And under these circumstances, and basically any other circumstances, the delta rule uh, converges, but it converges to the best fit uh, 
uh, possible, right? So it will try to find the best um, <clears throat> the best model that would fit our uh, ground truth uh, the best. Now, remember that when I say ground truth, I don't necessarily mean that um, the delta rule is only applicable to um, supervised learning. That definitely is not the case. But just to keep our, our discussion a little bit simpler, I'm just uh, using these words, these terminologies to make it, uh, to make the discussion smoother, okay? So the whole point is that the delta rule uh, doesn't fail to converge under any circumstances. So it will converge, but it will converge to the best fit, uh, to the best model possible. Now, it's just, it just so happens that the best model might be a terrible model, <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, I mean, the good thing about it is that it at least converges. But under um, when the training data are not linearly separable, the perceptron training rule actually never converges. I mean, I, actually, if you if you take a look at, let me just plot uh, a, an example of um, the progress in the error error of a neural network. Let's say, uh, let's say we have some number of epochs. For example, let's say uh, the horizontal axis uh, shows us our, it is our epoch number. And let's say the vertical axis shows our error. Now, if a network was uh, training properly, um, was being trained, trained properly, uh, the error, let me choose red, the error would behave, I mean, the, the error would just go down as training progress, something like this. It may, you might have some oscillation like that, but the general trend would, would be like this. So there is this um, gradual reduction in your error, but, and that would be a model that is behaving very nicely. But the problem is that if you have, um, like, like this example over here, if you have a case where your training examples are not linearly separable, then you have a big problem if you're going to use uh, a, a perceptron train, the perceptron training rule, and you're just using a perceptron to train your network. Because if you look at your error, let me just use another uh, color, maybe orange, uh, the error would be something like this. There is no hint of reduction or anything, so, so it fails to converge, um, as simple as that. So that is why, long story short, we are resorting to the popular uh, delta rule. Actually, one of the reasons that the delta rule is being applicable uh, in these, uh, under these circumstances is this. So, um, the famous gradient descent algorithm is tightly related to delta rule. And funny enough, the gradient descent algorithm is actually the basis of the other famous uh, algorithm that is called the backpropagation algorithm. That is the very foundation of turning a neural network. So if you think about it, um, a neural network, let's just uh, draw a black box like that. Let's just say this is a black box. It's a neural network. Let's say this is called ANN or our artificial neural network. And you've got your data coming in. Let's say this is my X coming in and your neural network generates an output. Let's call it Y hat. And let's say that you actually have your ground truth called Y, right? And then what happens is that by comparing these two, like my prediction is y hat and the actual ground truth is y, you come up with a measure that is the measure for your error, right? So this is how you compute your, your error, meaning that how terrible have I done? What we do in gradient descent is actually tuning our artificial neural network based on how well it has performed. Meaning that if you, if you, if you're uh, like a little bit familiar with the, with neural networks, you know that an, um, a neural network is nothing but a function estimator, right? So basically you have this true function, let's call that um, f of x, right? Um, what you're trying to do, you wanna estimate this other function Sorry, you want to actually um, estimate this function, but your estimation is going to be called, for example, um, f hat of x, right? So the neural network is nothing but that. But a neural network is not just a function of your input. It's also a function of all the parameters that you have uh, in your neural network, all the weights that you have. So if I want to have a schematic, 
um, you know, drawing of what is actually inside your network. You've got all these neurons that are highly connected to each other, like crazy number of connections, just, just all the way, all the way to the very output layer. Everything is just tightly, tightly connected. So you've got tons, tons and tons of weights here. Maybe in a deep model, you could have millions of weights. Um, so these weights are important. These weights are the ones that are gonna change in order for your neural network to work properly. And the way that th that these weights are being tuned is using uh, the delta rule, which uses gradient descent. Um, uh, this is not a a course on gradient descent, but to give you a very short description of what's happening here is that uh, your error. E over here, um, actually, you want to minimize that, right? So what you do here is that you take the partial derivative of your error with respect to every one of the weights in your neural network, every one of these weights, just, let's just say, with respect to WI, right? And what this means is that how much would the error change if I change my WI just a little bit? And when I say just a little bit, I mean just a little bit. Okay, so I'm just giving you a very short intuition as to what gradient descent does. And then based on this sensitivity, let's call this the sensitivity, sensitivity. Okay, for some reason this thing is malfunctioning, but it looks like it's, it came back to normal. Sensitivity of my error of the error with respect to wi the parameter wi right so if i know how sensitive the error is with respect to wi then it will tell me how should i change my wi meaning that the, the new value for wi would be the old value of wi plus something now that something has something to do with um, with how sensitive my error is with respect to WI. So it is actually a function of uh, this partial derivative that I showed you earlier. So that would be something along the line of this, okay? So this guy over here tells me how should I change WI so that the error would reduce. So as the error reduces, it means that my training is happening uh, successfully. And actually, uh, this principle can be uh, used in any type of neural network, regardless of how deep the neural network is. Um, for example, let's uh, just get rid of all these scribbles. Um, there's something called, uh, well, the backpropagation algorithm. What it does is, um, it is backpropagating something through the network. So meaning that after you generated your Y hat, uh, the network would measure the error and then it backpropagates something. And what does it backpropagate? That thing is uh, the thing that we just actually talked about, the sensitivities. It just backpropagates the sensitivity of the error with respect to every parameter in your neural network, every WI, right? So this is the thing that is being backpropagated. Um, so if this is your neural network, this is the thing that is being backpropagated throughout your network so that every W would tune itself, would change with the sole goal of minimizing your error. So the, the whole job is to minimize the error. But um, let me tell you something. Um, a neural network is nothing but a function estimator, right? So we're trying to estimate uh, the ultimate F. But if you want to have a better understanding as to what is inside a neural network, so if I want to make a bigger, a bigger black box so that I could have some room to show you what's happening. Um, what is happening here is that uh, we got this first layer, right? And then the second layer and then the third layer, and so on and so forth, until we, we reach to the very final layer that spits out the ultimate output Y hat for us, right? So that is the ultimate Y hat here. Now, what is happening here is that your input comes in from here, right? So X 
would come in here. It will in the first layer. What happens is that it will go through some uh, mathematical, um, you know, transformation. So if if I want to call that mathematical transformation uh, f, so x will go through um, f. Okay, so let me change my color here. So here we would have f of x over here. And then this f of x, the transformed version of our x, will be passed to the second layer. Remember that we've got all these uh, connections between them, crazy number of connections everywhere, right? So the f of x will be passed to the second layer where another transformation happens. Let's call that uh, g of x. Again, this will be passed to the next layer. Let's call that, um, actually, uh, this shouldn't be g of x. This would be g of whatever it is receiving. And the thing that it's receiving is actually f of x, right? So g of f of x. And then in the third layer, uh, let's call it the h function. That's, that's going to be h of g of f of x, right? So you've got this huge nest um, of, um, of different functions, one inside the other. And eventually, if I want to just make it, uh, well, more mathematically presentable, what happens is that, um, maybe green, yeah. So what happens is that, your x will go through the first layer that does transformation f. Let's call it f1. And then that would be passed to the second layer. Let's again, for consistency, call this f um, as well. Uh, let's call that transformation f of 2. That will go through this transformation. So, And then uh, the next layer, let's use another color here, maybe orange. Um, let's call the third layer f of f3. That means that this whole thing will be transformed using the third layer, and eventually this whole monstrous <laughs> nested formula would just be equal to your y hat, right? The ultimate output, which will be, will be compared to your y, and then it will compute. Uh, you will compute uh, your error, and then uh, so on and so forth. But Remember that at every one of these F's, you have loads of weights between the layers, right? So the job is to tune those weights in such a way that uh, it would actually minimize the error, right? Now, um, that is the whole goal. Now, remember, when it comes to gradient descent, the concept ha will not change, but when we have multiple layers nested, nested one into the other like that, uh, remember that. Let's call um, let's call the weights that are in the first layer um, w1 and layer 2 w2 and layer 3 w3. Right, so we have three sets of weights in here. Um, you have to find the gradient of the error with respect to each one of these weights. Right now, let me ask you something. If I were to f um, if I were to write the mathematical definition as to uh, uh, the gradient of my error, let me just erase this bit over here. Um, let's say I want to update the parameters in the first layer. Yeah. Um, then what happens is that I want to find the sensitivity of my error with respect to the parameters in my first layer. Let's call it W one. Remember that in order for this gradient to be able to um, to be actually computed, we have to use this thing called the chain rule, which is another name for this backpropagation over here. Um, using the chain rule, we're actually backpropagating this sensitivity all the way through our neural network through our neural network, through the third layer, through the second layer, through the first layer, to start to see our W1 in the first layer and to be able to touch it, to be able to change it, right? So with the chain rule bit, what happens is that you will have to say, okay, I don't have immediate access because uh, to our W1 because I'm on, on the outside of uh, my neural network. So what I have to do is, what I do have access to is, 
my f3 right the f3 function so i'm gonna take the derivative with respect to my f3 and then f3 has an immediate access to f2 and then f2 has an immediate access to f1 actually, actually this is three so f2 the partial derivative of f2 with respect to f1 and finally f1 has a direct access to w1 right you see all of these chained together that is why they call it uh, the chain rule meaning that in order to find the partial derivative of error with respect to w1 i had to go through a chain of functions all the way to the first layer right and if you multiply all these partial derivatives together uh, according to the chain rule you actually get the partial derivative of error with respect to w1 and then um, if you notice you are actually doing this back propagation thing you're just taking the, the gradient of error with respect to uh, f3 and you're back propagating it and transforming it with respect to f2 and then f1 and then ultimately uh, w1 and you um, um, uh, eventually compute uh, the partial derivative of error with respect to w1 which will help you to update your w1 you're gonna say w1 equals the old value of w1 uh, plus the sensitivity now uh, this is not a very accurate description but this is more or less the story, okay? This is more or less the story as to why we care about, remember, the delta rule. Because delta rule uses gradient descent uh, to find the best fitting model to the data. And gradient this descent is very interesting because it is the foundation of the very famous algorithm called the backpropagation algorithm. So if you understand the delta rule, that's my whole message. If you understand the delta rule, you can actually govern the, the, the ability to understand how you could train different types of neural network. And that is amazing. That, that, that is what I'd love uh, for you to be, um, to be equipped with. So in order to understand the delta rule in a more visual sense, what, what I'm going to do here is, is actually what Tom Mitchell did in his uh, famous uh, machine learning book. Um, uh, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to define a structure for a type of neural network and then I'm going to define an error function and then in the next video I'm going to actually visualize the, uh, the error, the error surface and actually tell you more in, in, a, in, a, in a far more visual sense as to what is really happening, what we're really trying to do uh, using the delta rule and eventually we'll, we'll jump into the mathematical uh, complexities of delta rule and get far more comfortable with this amazing tool. So in order to paint a picture of what type of neural network we're trying to uh, use. Let's consider an unthresholded perceptron, okay? It's because a perceptron by definition has, uh, in, in the, it is basically a very shallow type of neural network. It just has one, um, um, the, the input layer and then all of the input layer would be basically, um, if you consider this as the input layer in our perceptron, right let's call it x uh, this whole thing will be uh, using some weights will be sort of uh, compressed um, into one particular value which will go through a uh, a neuron and then uh, the eventually will produce the y hat it's a very simple type of neural network and uh, the transformation function that we use in this particular neural neuron is a step function which is just like this and we actually in, in this in this very series uh, we actually talked about perceptrons so feel free to just jump back and take a look at them to refresh your memory so consider a unthresholded uh, type of perceptron where we don't have any threshold and what we have though as type uh, as the you know activation function in this neuron is actually a linear function linear that is how we show a linear activation function and you know that a linear function basically doesn't do anything to its input so what happens is that f of x equals x right so whatever is received at this point 
to this neuron will be the same as what would survive it and would get out, right? So that is a linear uh, unit. And then, um, if you if you think about it, mathematically speaking, um, we have these W's over here in the middle, and the value over here, I mean, after the weights are multiplied by, uh, by your input, the values over here are actually the result of the multiplication of the weight vector and your input vector. Because, well, they are vectors, after all, and the dot product of them. So previously, because we had the step function, we actually had to take this into this um, the sine function um, that was actually our mathematical um, implementation of our step function. Right? So we would have to pass that through the sine function over here. Uh, but what, what we're gonna do now, because it's a linear function, um, it, it means that the O or the output of our network, which is over here, over here, our output, um, that would be equal to the exact same thing that is received by this neuron. Meaning that the linear um, function over here will not do anything to this input. Because Ultimately, we want to find a training rule, which is our delta rule. We want, to, we want to come up with a proper rule that would tell us how we should change our W's over here to W's over here so that the ultimate error in the output would be minimized. In order to do that, we actually have to come up with a definition of an error, right? So we need to measure for the training error of a hypothesis. And our hypotheses are our weights, right? We have this um, search problem happening over here. So for every training data in our, um, let's call them X, for every training data, we will Give, we will put some we will basically apply some changes into our weights and with the sole goal of minimizing the error so what happens is implicitly I'm telling you that you have this huge search space um, let me call that the hypothesis space again we have a very nice set of videos on hypothesis space and the search of hypothesis space uh, uh, hypothesis uh, spaces um, in the I think the first category or the first the very first videos of, um, of this channel um, so I invite you to just to take a look at them to refresh your memory about hypothesis space but just just to give you a very small and short um, introduction we have this huge space we call this the hypothesis space let's call it H we've got loads of weights just floating in this network uh, in this space so we want to find the weight the one that would make the error as small as possible we were looking in this whole space to find W star and the way we do that we're going to use delta rule, which is going to use gradient descent to figure out the sensitivity of error with respect to all the weights in our network so that they will finally converge to this W star after we keep changing them. So when this W star happens, when our weights are actually equal to this or very close to this, our error, or let's call that the training error, the training error, will have been minimized, which is the entire goal of training a neural network or any type of machine learning algorithm for that matter. So the type of uh, error function that we're gonna use is actually the sum squared error. Um, what happens here is that, let's say that you've got uh, D, capital D, which is all of your training examples, and every D is the index for every one of the training examples in your uh, training set, capital D. And what happens is that for every one of those data points in your training set, as you pass them through your neural network, remember you've got this uh, neural network, let's call this again A N N which has a linear unit um, and it's unthresholded. For every input data that jumps in, let's call that um, XD, you will generate a OD, output D. And for every one of them, you will have a ground truth. Let's call it um, truth T D, 
right? So for every one of those examples, you will find uh, the difference between the two and you square it. And then you sum across all the training examples, hence this uh, little sign over here, uh, the sigma sign. So you sum across uh, all the training examples. Um, basically, so that would be the sum of uh, the squares of uh, the differences between the ground truth and the output of your neural network across the training example. And eventually you've got this little one over two on the outside. Um, uh, you will see why that one over two is important. Mathematically speaking, that would save us from uh, loads of trouble. Um, so that was the actual introduction to the delta rule as to the big picture as to what it is. And now we have introduced the basic ideas of the things that we're going to need to be able to dig deeper into the delta rule. In the next video, we're going to have a much better uh, visualization um, as to um, what the error surface looks like and what we're really trying to do. Um, feel free to subscribe to this channel and you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, them all done. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the just um, in, in, in the comment section of this video. I'd be more than merrier to respond to them. And I hope that this has been informative for you. And thank you very much for watching.